again. So Casey Neistat had an interview with Robert Kinsell, the chief business officer of YouTube. After getting so fed up with YouTube shit, he asked Robert if he would come down to his studio to do an interview. Face to face with Casey Neistat. This started getting hyped up at the end of last week, and I was really looking forward to it. And I'm kind of surprised that it even happened, considering how impersonal YouTube seemed all of last year. This kind of gives me hope that the five priorities that Susan Wojcicki listed on her blog post might actually be followed up on. One of those priorities was prioritizing transparency and communication. And talking face to face with someone very high up at YouTube is indeed a form of communication. The interview took place on January 31st, so recent topics like Logan Paul's demonetization and him deciding to fly around a dying body of a fish like a toy airplane aren't included in this interview. But let's take a look at some of the stuff that I thought was pretty interesting about it. So I'm Robert Kinsel, I'm Chief Business Officer of YouTube. And uh, in my day-to-day -day job, I'm responsible for all of the YouTube creators and, and, um, and content partners who are making their living on YouTube and, and creating amazing audiences. Just to clarify a little bit on what Robert said there, he's basically the guy that's in charge of dealing with all the stuff on the creator side of YouTube. Kind of like the harbinger of the companions in Skyrim, except it's for people who make 10-minute Vine compilations instead of warriors who slaughter werewolf hunters. I think most, people, most people's questions have to do with the Logan Paul controversy because it's still very, very fresh. And then what's it like inside of YouTube when something like that or any of the previous controversies happen? Is there a protocol in place? And we have escalation processes that take place and, um, and we're looking at you know, how, this, how this works against the guidelines, uh, the community guidelines that we have set on YouTube. That statement kind of throws me off kilter because when the original Suicide Forest Logan Paul video was manually reviewed, it was given the okay by a human reviewer. I'd like to know what the thought process in that reviewer's head was like at the time. I'd imagine it's something like trying to do a backflip on LSD, so YouTube probably either need to or past tense needed to revise how the reviewers were looking over these things. How did it, how did it land on the homepage? Um, I think you have, um, there are no simple answers to that, except that um, there was a lot of interest in that video. There were a lot of search searches for it all around the world on YouTube, and it, and it ended up there. Still, it's really not making clear that how, even after it was manually reviewed and ended up on a curated trending list, that the video wasn't removed by YouTube themselves, but rather by Logan himself after being run out in front of the proverbial firing squad. You know, with Logan and a lot of his projects uh, for original productions, there are hundreds of people involved, people whose paychecks depend on it. So we don't want to make a rash decision uh, that impacts so many people's uh, livelihood. It's not just Logan, it's many other people across multiple projects. I feel like that's a fairly decent reason for the less than timely proper response, not counting the one that YouTube gave Philip DeFranco the day on or the day after. With PewDiePie, most of what he does is just him and his editors doing the work, and YouTube probably saw it as not as serious, and they likely felt safer making a swift decision with that one. Alternatively, YouTube may have felt that they did act too fast in the PewDiePie situation, and they didn't want to make a repeat mistake with Logan here, just to get bent over so far that they touched their toes with their head by mainstream media websites and creating another adpocalypse all over again. Alternatively, alternatively, they could have just not wanted to get rid of Logan for whatever reason. Not chase sensationalism, not chase views for the sake of views, uh, not use drama for the sake of views, and not use drama at our expense for the sake of views. Right? So what's at heart for us is that we deeply care about the creator ecosystem. That's my job. Uh, if you don't succeed, we don't succeed. Did you hear that, Hoover? No sensationalism, you bastard. But seriously, that if you don't succeed, we don't succeed line is used a couple more times throughout this interview by Robert. I'm not sure what intention is behind Robert Kinsell trying to drive that point home. Whether that's because he genuinely wants creators to do well because he genuinely cares, or because it just helps the website in general. Either way, it's not super important what the motivation behind that point is, at least in my opinion. What I think matters more here is how Kinsell and just YouTube in general as a company define success. Is it a person creating Creating content that finds an audience and allows that creator to make a living off of making that content? Or is it a creator specifically making the type of content that YouTube wants them to because it helps push forward an image of YouTube that the site wants pushed? I wish there was a definitive answer to that. It might easily seem like the latter because of YouTube's favoring towards featuring vlogger types and things like YouTube Rewind and just in general. But then again, they also invited people like H3H3 to come on YouTube Rewind and they just weren't able to make it. They also were going to feature Ethan and Hula on an episode of Scare PewDiePie Season 2. Before that show ended up in the same black hole that presumably Ray William Johnson got sucked into, but we get a bit more of an answer of the type of content that Robert likes in the next clip. I, so I personally uh, like a lot of news content, news related content on YouTube. Um, it, it just you know helps catch up on everything that's going on and it's just and it has a different flair on YouTube. 
educational content, but I don't mean the traditional educational mm -hmm. sense. It's just that I, I've learned something new. Fair enough! Drama Alert and Scarce are prestigious news sources unlike any other on this platform and outside of it. True innovators of the genre. In all my years in television, I never met a TV studio head who wasn't at one time a TV producer. In, in, in cinema, I've never met a movie studio head who didn't produce movies. But no one on the YouTube sort of senior executive leadership side yep. has ever made a living as a creator. So how do you, how does Susan, mm -hmm. how do the other leaders at YouTube empathize with the struggles of being a creator having never been there yourself? I, I started in the mailroom of a talent agency working with writers, actors, directors, stapling their pictures and resumes and sending it to cast interviews, etc. Became an assistant and just well, went to work for a production, movie production financing company, so made a lot of films and, um, and then went to HBO and launch HBO's uh, around the world and eventually to Netflix and then to YouTube. So I've been around content uh, all of my uh, professional career. That is a good start, but in order to truly understand the demographic that's outraged or upset by what YouTube has done recently, you have to have been in their position first. You have to have made content on a platform like YouTube first. You don't necessarily have to have lived off of it, you just have to actually have produced content to get an understanding of what goes into it, and what people feel like they are losing when they don't get what they feel like they deserve back out of it. The next bit actually struck me as a bit comical, but it really does make sense if you think about it. There's nothing more painful than hear from the advertisers, uh, their stories and nothing more painful is than hear from the creators and and you should know both sides think that we favor the other <laughs> both sides think so, you know and so we clearly have work to do of the it, ecosystem it's sometimes easy to forget that advertisers are a very big part of this equation mostly because a good amount of people see them as the sole reason that we're getting fucked sideways in regards to ads but it's not just youtube bending creators to their way a lot of that comes back to advertisers but i'm sure a lot of advertisers feel like that youtube is letting their creators bend them to their way it's interesting how that mentality works both ways just like a switch in bed uh, let me ask you about the yellow icon mm -hmm. because from a creator from the most cynical creator perspective what it what it's viewed as is a way of saying we think this might not be advertiser friendly so we're going to cut your revenue on it but we're still playing it so it's costing you the it's costing you the creator money while we figured this out um, and I think that I know I as a creator found that very insulting I found mm -hmm. that very upsetting why do I have to take your algorithm's mistake I think that was maybe October or yeah. somewhere there yeah. and um, and that's when we started to think about the let's 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 you know. Let's tell creators that they shouldn't, um, you know, publish them yet. Have them unlisted. It gets reviewed. It's scanned, and then, um, and then you know they won't go through the volatility. So that that has worked. Which side of the table has it worked for though? For a lot of creators, me not being one of them in all honesty, seeing as I don't have the ability to run ads on my channel just yet. Please give me ads YouTube, I'm begging you. Is it working for advertisers? Who are seeing that their ads are mostly just being run on the family friendly fun time content that it seems like to us at least that YouTube pushes a lot. Or for creators because their videos are getting green lighted before they get uploaded. So when it's in the stage that it would actually get views, you're actually getting money from those views instead of waiting for your video to be approved for monetization. I don't know! As a creator, it feels like there is a lot of tension between the creator community and YouTube as a company. Is that, is that felt, do you think it's a fair statement, is that felt within YouTube as a company? I wouldn't want to call it tension because it would, it would imply that we're on opposite sides somehow and we're not, like we're on the same side. The thing that we have struggled with, and you've told that to me multiple times, is communication. I think this is a point that should be given to Robert Kinsell and YouTube here because they have been pretty rough with communication before. Until now it just felt like a faceless conglomerate or entity just spitting words on Twitter every now and then. This interview kind of works like a gateway into the wall that YouTube seems to have put up because we're talking to an actual face for once. I think that YouTube's never been good at saying here's what matters to us, here's what we stand for, and here's what to expect from us. So I invite you to now just kind of use this platform as a way to tell all of us creators in the community what matters to you, um, what do you stand for, and, and what is next for YouTube as, as a platform. I love how through the entire interview, Casey Neistat has just been throwing around stuff on his desk, plopping clipboards down so nonchalantly. He's giving one of the first interviews of its kind for a platform as big as YouTube, and he's acting about as casual about it as I am at Waffle House at 3 a.m. What do we stand for is, uh is really four freedoms. Freedom of opportunity, 
anybody to make a living on YouTube, you know, bring revenue from the entire world. And there are many wonderful examples. Uh, freedom of speech, uh, as important as ever. Freedom of information, accessing it. I grew up in, in a communist country in Czechoslovakia behind the Iron Curtain. And then the fourth one is uh, freedom to belong. People creating communities on YouTube that they can feel like they can share a bit more with, uh, that they may not have in person somewhere else, but on YouTube they do. So we have these four core freedoms that we, we uh, truly care about. What, um, what is important to us is the success of our partners. The partners are creators, and advertisers. All right, we have YouTube's priorities spoken on record. A couple million people will probably have heard Robert Kinsell say it at this point. There's no avoiding it now, YouTube. But no, seriously, those do sound like good things to strive for and to uphold. Let's just hope YouTube manages to do it. And those are the parts of the interview that I found to be the most interesting. And as a whole, I think this interview is actually pretty good, both in its substance and the fact that it happened at all. I think Casey probably could have asked some harder questions, but it's not like he went super easy Call of Duty 4 recruit mode, and he's not really a professional journalist. I can't justifiably expect the world from him on things like this. I appreciate YouTube and Robert Kinsell giving this type of interview to an actual creator because it's really the first time that we've gotten to connect an actual face and an actual person whose upbringing we've actually learned somewhat about with Robert telling us that he grew up in Czechoslovakia behind the Iron Curtain and all that to YouTube. And it's nice being able to attach a face to YouTube's words other than just Susan would just Plus it also gives us insight into the mind of the person who's essentially in charge of dealing with creators on this website, which to me was pretty interesting to say the least. I hope we do see more interviews like this with higher ups at YouTube, hopefully done with more creators on this website. Casey Neistat suggested that if YouTube wanted to do future interviews like this, that they do one with Philip DeFranco, which I think is a good suggestion as well. But anyways, I'm gonna wrap this video up here. If you guys enjoyed, be sure to drop a like, and if you're new, subscribe. If you guys think there are any interesting parts of the interview that I missed, if you think anything I said was stupid, you disagree, have anything to add, or just anything in general, be sure to leave that in the comments below. And in case any of you guys are interested, I have a weekly live podcast called Pullover. I try to stream it every Friday at 8 p.m. EST, but times and dates do very depending on the guests and my schedules. So follow me on Twitter at Quiet for updates on when I'm streaming. The cast is going on break for about two weeks because I'm going to be out of town for those weekends. But if you want to check out any of the episodes that have already aired, they're all on a separate channel. There's a link to that in the sidebar of my channel and in the description. Last episode, I had Wild Spartans and FPS Diesel line. I thought it was pretty good. I also have a Discord server if you guys want to check that out. There's a link to that in the description as well. But anyways, now that I've taken advantage of my shameless plugs more than Apple does its dying batteries, this has been Quiet, and I will see you guys next time. Thank you.